20th century poet Hugh McDermott was born 100 years ago on August the 11th, 1892. To mark his 80th birthday, the BBC commissioned a profile composed of his works and illustrated by contributions from colleagues, friends and family. BBC Two now pays tribute once again to the rebel poet. Poets are a very small minority of people who, for some obscure reason, have failed to grow up. In other words, they're natural rebels. I think that he is the greatest Scottish poet we've ever had, including Barnes and Dunbar. And for that matter, I think he is the greatest living poet now on either side of the Atlantic. Most people don't understand poets. They see them as rebels against the system to which they themselves have automatically conformed. And that was what Blake meant when he said, all poets belong to the devil's party. The devil being the opposition to the social norms. Hugh McDermott is the pen name of Christopher Grieve. Grieve was born in the border town of Langham in 1892. At that time, it had about three to four thousand of a population, occupied mainly in the Tweed Mills, about which I've written in some of my poems. And it's a very lovely little place. Lies in a hollow at the confluence of three rivers, the Esk, the Warhook, and the Use. And it's that contrast between the bare slopes of the hills and the concentration of life in the valleys that gives its distinctive character to the borders. My mother belonged country people. Her brothers, her father, were all either farm workers or things of that kind. My father was a postman, a rural postman, and uh, his people were mill workers in Langham. His father was a power loom tuner. It's queer that born in the Langham, it's no until just knew I see what it means to work in the mill like my friends. I was trying to say something in a recent poem about Lenin. You've read a good lot in the news, but ken the lesson. Look, Willie, here is his secret now, in a way I can share it with you. His secret, and the secret of all that's worth talk. The shuttles fleeing over quick for my in, prompt for thought and the coordination between weaver and machine. The hail shops come thundering to a stranger like me. Second nature to you. You're perfectly able to think, speak and see a pair for the looms. But to some, that doesn't so easily come. Lenin was like that with working class life. At him we talk. His force movements couldn't have been fewer. The best weaver Earth ever saw. All he today moved intact, clean, clear, and exact. Border plates famous. Shall things of mere consequence? Shame us. The fact that we were so near the border threw up the differences between the Scots and the English uh, very saliently. And apart from that, uh, the people in the border towns, when I was a boy, were very radical. It was after Gladstone's Midlothian campaign, and uh, they always voted liberal, but they were actually more radical than liberal. And uh, they all shared this frontier feeling of difference from the English and, in fact, animosity to them. The old border tradition of uh, raids and reavers and so on still subsisted in a modified way, but it was capable of uh, political extension at any rate, also capable, of course, of uh, literary expression. And uh, I seized on these things very early. And I think not only my literary work, but my political tendencies did back to that time. Michael Grieve. My father has always been single-minded, not in any narrow, easy way, but on a very, very wide and broad basis. Almost single-handed, he elevated 
Scottish poetry back onto the international level. At the same time, he was a founder member of the Scottish National Party and, incredibly, also espoused communism. All he knew halfway who's, but I be more extremes meet. It's the only way I can to dodge the cursed conceit of being wrecked that damns the vast majority of men. I'll bury me heed like an ostriches, nor yet believe my in and nothing else. My senses may advise me, but I'll be myself, no matter what they tells. I hear they do some foreign philosopher has rocked the system out to justify all this. But I'm a Scot. What blindly follows old Scottish instincts. And I want to try. For I've no faith in ought I can explain. And stirred, for the philosophers leave off. Morning, Dr. Good morning. A travelling library calls once a week at the road end that leads to the poet's cottage. And books have always been a necessary part of his life's nourishment. A library was housed in the building where he was brought up. And he claims to have read almost every one of its volumes before he left home. He started to train as a teacher, but his father died and he turned to journalism. One of his first jobs was in South Wales. That was a very good initiation in left-wing journalism. Because at that time, they had a big battalion of uh, Welsh uh, socialist MPs going to the House of Commons. And some of them were very colourful characters. And uh, for a young man, I was barely into my 20s at that time, it was a very rewarding experience. And I liked the Welsh people and always have done ever since. I think I got my first inkling into the sort of relationship between the Celtic peoples of the United Kingdom at that time. In the First World War, Christopher Greaves served abroad in the Royal Army Medical Corps. He and six other soldiers in his field ambulance unit contracted cerebral malaria. All the others died, but Greaves recovered, and in 1919 returned to Scotland. He was married by this time, and within a week he was back in journalism, on the Montrose Review which has its offices tucked in behind a courtyard just off the high street. It was quite natural that not only did I find myself at home in the journalistic work, that that made an easy bridge into other spheres of public activity. And in a year or two, I found myself on the town council, the parish council, the education authority and other things. And I had a very busy and happy time in Montrose. He made his home at 16 Lynx Avenue, and in 1922, the first number of a literary magazine was issued from that address. It was the beginning of a Scottish literary revival, and there was a new name among the contributors. Christopher Grieve had invented Hugh McDermott and resurrected a dead language. He looked at a churchyard in Montrose and remembered another time, another place. Oh, to be at Crowdy now, when the last trumpet blows and see the deed come loping o'er the old grey wars. Muckle men with toozled beards a grat at as a bairn, or scramble frae the crudded clay with feck a swearn. And glower at God and all his gang of angels of the lift, they trashy, bleasin' French-like folk for guard them shift. Fain the women folk will seek to make them hud the row. Fegs, God's no blade can he stirs up the men of crowdy now. First dead person I ever saw was my mother's father, my grandfather, and his funeral was the first funeral I attended, and it was to crowdy now. And even then, with affection, I had that revulsion from normality. My uncles and other relatives, big bodily bearded men and so on, and I imagined them rising from these crowded graves in the little churchyard, and how they would behave, because they were wild men. A face that was red as a cook skin, as grey as a stain, and a man for the women, as lion himself, Elaine. 
a critic and fellow poet, Edwin Morgan. In a sense, these early lyrics are attractive because they are ballads or songs. You can relate them to ballad and to, even to folk poetry, and he sometimes does use earlier folk poetry in them as part of the charm they have, but they're also uh, more interesting just because of the combination of this disarmingly simple ballad form and the extraordinary strangeness of the imagery that he uses. That's what made them so very new and so very different, especially the strange perspective, the strange point of view that he introduces in many of these poems. Hawkins on Whitner Bethlehem's Earth twinkles like a star the night And Whitner shepherds lift their heads in its unearthly light Yont all the stars o'er een can see And further than their lichts can fly A mony a nanka whirl the night The fate for bairnies cry In mony a nanka whirl the night the lift gaze black as pitch at noon, and sideways on their chests the heeds o oh, endless Christs roll doon. And when the earth's as calls them in, and o oh, its folk are lang sign deed, on countless stars the babe mun cry, and the crucified mun bleed. The years of Montrose ended in 1929, and at this time there were a series of crises, domestic, financial, creative, psychological. In three volumes published in two years, he had made a literary revolution. Feelings had been hurt, reputations damaged. He was a muckraker as well as a poet, and he categorized those he would sweep out of sight. The whole gang of high mucky mucks, hollow men with headpieces stuffed with straw, Birdwits, lookers under beds, trained seals, creeping Jesuses, Scots wahavers, village idiots, policemen, leaders of white mouse factions, noted connoisseurs of bread and butter, glorified gangsters, and what Billy Phelps calls meddler novelists, the meddler being a fruit that becomes rotten before it's ripe, commercial Calvinists, makers of noises like a turnip, and all the touts and toadies and licks, spittles of the English ascendancy, and their infernal womanfolk, and all their skuncoil skullduggery. And this invective, according to the poet Norman McCaig, is typical of the man. Quarrels of food and drink to him, but they are top-of-the-head quarrels. The old Scottish thing, flighting, is a very important thing to him. Vituperation to him is an art form. He enjoys it. And he would slit a throat with a pen but he would never brush your hair the wrong way around in, in, in real life. After all, blasphemy and obscenity and invective and so on are all rhetorical weapons that writers in past times and healthier times perhaps, particularly in classical times, used without any compunction. And I don't see why, in the interests of open-hearted debate and general argument and so on, we shouldn't recover the use of these weapons. We don't require to be too mealy-mouthed. But in 1933, Christopher Grieve, Hugh McDermott, was in retreat. And the refuge that he chose was a small, windswept island in Shetland, 120 miles north of the Scottish mainland. He had come through three disastrous years and had been divorced from his first wife. Fortunately, he had also met and married a young Cornish woman, Valda Trevlin, who was his match in courage and endurance. It was just as well, because he was over 40 and destitute, and he and his wife faced nine years of what a friend called penury and poverty. The island they chose was Halsey, and on it they found an unwanted, now ruined cottage for a rental of 27 shillings a year. And sometimes, as their son remembers, there were fish to be had for the taking, a bucket full of mackerel, perhaps, which the other islanders considered to be dirty fish. He also remembers climbing the cliffs and gathering seagulls' eggs for pickling and storing. There's that kind of, not a razor edge existence, but always being very conscious indeed that there was very, very little money around. This was, in fact, uh, at a time when he had his most productive period, and perhaps it was 
the isolation, uh, the enforced isolation in many ways, uh, that made him turn in on himself and concentrate on the very large flow of work which he produced in these eight or nine, ten years. The social scene could be little but confusion and loss to me. And Scotland, better than all your towns, was a bed of moss to me. I was better with the sounds of the sea than with the voices of men. And in desolate and desert places, I found myself again. For the whole of the world came from these. And he who returns to the source may gauge the worth of the outcome and approve and perhaps reinforce or disapprove and perhaps change its course. Oh, creative work in the arts proceeds from below the level of consciousness. And one has to dig into oneself, down to the very depths of one's personality, to get the kind of material that's required for first-class creative work. There are plenty of ruined buildings in the world, but no ruined stone. This is no heap of broken images. These stones go through man straight to God, if there is one. What have they not gone through already? Empires, civilizations, eons. Only in them, if in anything, can his creation confront him. They came so far out of the water and halted forever. That larking dallier of the sun has only been able to play with superficial byproducts since. The moon moves the water backwards and forwards. But the stones cannot be lured an inch further, either on this side of eternity or the other. Who thinks God is easier to know than they are? What happens to us is irrelevant to the world's geology. But what happens to the world's geology is not irrelevant to us. The years in Shetland saw changes in McDermott's work. He seemed to abandon the use of Scots and began to write a much longer, more intellectual kind of poetry. His wife, Valda, feels strongly about the neglect that he suffered and the difficulties that faced him at this time. He was doing so much work in the Shetlands. I mean, he was so... I think he was really at the height that if only some publisher had, had the guts uh, to have taken a chance on him at that time, I mean, his output could have been trebled. It is a grey world. Sea and sky are colourless as the grey stones. And the small fields are hidden by the walls that fence them on every side. Seen in perspective, the walls overlap each other as far as the skyline on the hill, hiding every blade of grass between them, so that all the island appears one jumble of grey boulders. The last grey wall outlined on the sky has the tracery effect of a hedge of thorns in winter. It was a very good period, so far as I was concerned, for work. I produced an enormous amount of stuff there. I found the change of environment extremely stimulating, and I liked the Shetland people immensely. But it didn't solve the problem of ways and means. I had no visible means of support, and one couldn't get any kind of work for which I was qualified in the Shetland Islands, with the consequence that we had a very lean time indeed. And uh, after the Second World War broke out, the position became completely untenable. The authorities tried to put me to work on the roads, for which I didn't feel I was especially qualified. And uh, various options were presented to me, so I opted to go in for engineering. Now, at the age of 50, a nation's greatest poet was faced with hard manual labor in an engineering shop on industrial Clyde side. Typically, he said that going from one extreme to another was, of course, in keeping with his philosophy. 
His foreman at this time was Charles Nicholl, a thoughtful man and an enthusiastic photographer. When he came over to my department, it was obvious the man had no experience of heavy work at all and uh, was out, really out of his sphere altogether. After all, he was a man of letters, he was a writer, and he wasn't accustomed to really heavy industrial work. And for a man of his journalistic abilities, it was amazing that his potentiality wasn't put to very much better use by the authorities of that time. Perhaps that is understandable when we consider his uh, political uh, outlook, but at the same time, it was inexcusable that a man of his abilities should be put into such a place to, to work with unfamiliar tools, tools he had never handled in his life before, didn't know, even know how to hold. I think that was ridiculous. 1942, the year when McDermott went to work as an engineer, was also the year in which he published his autobiography, Lucky Poet. It was dedicated to his wife, subtitled, A Self-Study in Literature and Political Ideas. And in it, he included a chapter entitled, The Kind of Poetry I Want. Constantly, I seek a poetry of facts, even as the profound kinship of all living substance is made clear by the chemical route. Without some chemistry, one is bound to remain forever a dumbfounded savage in the face of vital reactions. The beautiful relations shown only by biochemistry replace a stupefied sense of wonder with something more wonderful because natural and understandable. Nature is more wonderful when it is at least partly understood. A poetry abstruse as hedge laying and full as the countryside in which I have watched the practice of that great old art. In photographic language, wide angle poems, taking in the whole which explains the part, scientifically accurate, fully realized in all their details, A poetry, like the hope of achieving ere very long, a tolerable idea of what happens from first to last if we bend a piece of wire backwards and forwards until it breaks. And thus a poetry which fully understands that the era of technology is a necessary fact. A poetry, like an operating theater, sparkling with a swift, deft energy. Energy quiet and contained and fearfully alert, in which the poet exists only as a nurse during an operation, who exists only to have a sponge ready when called for. Wads of sterilized cotton wool, nothing else having the smallest meaning for her. A poetry related to science and technology, to medicine and engineering, a poetry of fact, but also of feeling. Oh, she was full of loving fuss when I cut my hand and the blood gushed out. And cleverly she dressed the wound and wrapped it in a clout. Oh, tenderly she tended me. Though deep in her eyes I could tell the secret joy that men are wiles obliged to bleed as well. The great majority of poems in the last thousand years in Europe and other countries have been concerned with fancy rather than imagination. It has been believed that there was a thing called the poetic, things that were more suitable for poetry than other things. And that excluded the vast majority of the concerns of modern mankind. Whether we like it or not, we're involved in the scientific age. And the whole business of science is utterly opposed to the indulgence of fancy as opposed to imagination. 
Imagination penetrates. Fancy is conjured up from nowhere. So to rid poetry of fancy, one wants to equate it more and more with science. One doesn't want to use images that give false ideas, pre-scientific ideas. One wants, all along the line, to write a poetry that, while not necessarily expounding scientific ideas, in no way contravenes them. Edwin Morgan. Well, I, I'm one of the people who believe this is worth doing. I know that it's generally not thought to be a very uh, sensible thing to do, but it seems to me that in spite of the failures and the difficulties that are involved, the enormous stumbling blocks in trying to do this, it is worth doing, because I think there is a case for saying that that's the one area that modern poetry has tended to neglect, the whole area of science and technology and fact. And McDermott, of course, claims forerunners like Walt Whitman, and fair enough, he, he can trace himself back if he wants to. He clearly believes that this is important, uh, both from the point of view of theory, I think, and also because it was one of the things he found he could do once he moved off the lyric. Perhaps there was some kind of failure of the lyric impulse, he wanted to do something else. He does find something else that he can do. Sometimes I'm asked, if I'm a Christian, and of course I'm not a Christian. Apart from any other reason, I don't want to be a Christian or any other thing except myself. It's the development of myself, and as a consequence of that, the possibility of the development by other people of all their own selves that I'm concerned with. Now that's a basically democratic idea. But it's not a democratic idea within the limits of what we understand politically in this and certain other countries as democracy. It harks back rather to the realization that we're all human and that all our main interests must necessarily, because of our common humanity, have a great deal in common. That's the basis of the sort of general communism that underlies all my work. Man does not cease to interest me when he ceases to be miserable. Quite the contrary. That it is important to aid him in the beginning goes without saying. Like a plant, it is essential to water at first. But this is in order to get it to flower. And I am concerned with the blossom Norman McKay. Critics of Chris Grieve, and there are plenty, generally for non-literary reasons, of course, often say, often point out what a tremendously uneven poet he is, and I agree with them, he is. He's the most uneven great poet I know anything about. But what a little angers me is that when we talk about the work of poets in the past, you know, Keats, Shelley, you name them, Milton, we're generally thinking of about 10% or 15% of their total work, and I cannot see why we shouldn't extend the same grace to contemporary writers, to Chris Grieve, Hugh McDermott. I think if his total works were put through my own critical sieve, I would be left with 20% perhaps. But the point is that that 20% is not only of the kind of quality that I've indicated, there is such a bulk of it that he is, in spite of the other 80%, a great poet. You can put him on the shelf with all the great poets that one can think of, and his leaves don't wither. It requires great love of it, deeply to read the configuration of a land gradually grow conscious of fine shadings, of great meanings and slight symbols. Hear at last the great voice that speaks softly. See the swell and fall upon the flank of a statue carved out in a whole country's marble. So I have gathered unto myself all the loose ends of Scotland and by naming them and accepting them, loving them and identifying myself with them, attempt to express the whole. In book after book, McDermott attempted to express the whole. He borrowed, sometimes without acknowledgement, from other writers, 
and more than once left himself open to the charge of plagiarism. In many of his later works especially, he's used quotation a great deal, often very lengthy quotation, and often pretty close to the actual text. The only changes being very occasional, but perhaps the big change of turning a prose text into a verse text, which is maybe quite important. And he believes that this is one way of building up a kind of mosaic pattern in a very long poem, and therefore you can justify it. I don't see the objection to that. It's been the practice of not minor versifiers, but great poets all throughout literary history. It was a very great poet who himself said all poets are plagiarists, and the greater the poet, the greater the plagiarist. I think that's true. I don't see why in the business of writing a body of poetry, one needs to pay too much attention to ordinary common sense ideas of what is lawful or not lawful. One simply uses the material to hand in the way one can. It used to be said that an old woman complained that Shakespeare was full of quotations. That was the reason, of course. We're all full of quotations, only some of us are adroit enough to choose our quotations from sources that aren't so easily checked as others. <laughs> I don't think anyone who is so single-minded, who has so many ideas, who lives and thrives uh, on intellect, is a very easy person uh, to live with. And my father certainly, in many ways, was not. Poets have proved bad husbands and bad domestic people generally, the great majority of them, have been very difficult to deal with a poet in domestic surroundings. He is a natural rebel against everything. Otherwise, he can't express anything new. Lured in my head as winter lies the state that Scotland's in the day. Spring in the north as I come slow. But no, do our winters like to stay for good? I know for good. Oh, weighs me on the weary days when it is scarce grey licht at noon. It mun be all the stupid folk diffusing their dullness round and round like soot that keeps the sunlight out. I don't think there's any doubt at all that my father, in many, many ways, has been a lonely man in the sense that he was trying to do something which was enormously difficult, which no one else had done. And at the same time, there was a, a very dispiriting lack uh, of encouragement on many fronts. And at the same time, there weren't very many people who had the intellectual capabilities uh, or the desire to talk about the kinds of things which really interested him. He admits that at times he has been his own worst enemy, careless in some of his work, heedless of his reputation. Well, it's true, of course, that I have been careless in that sense. You might also say that that carelessness had its root in a contempt for public opinion, which is also true. This is something that one just has to accept as part of the temperament of the man. He has this, this kind of quality in that he seems to be more concerned to keep producing, to show that he has this extraordinary fund of energy which will keep him going through different phases, starting with early lyrics, moving on to political poetry, moving on to philosophical poetry, still keeping going, still pouring out all sorts of things. It's like what he has said about himself in one of his letters where he speaks about uh, being a kind of volcano which throws out a great deal of rubbish as well as fire and flame but he says he'd rather be a volcano doing this than someone laying a tit's egg and you can see that there is a good deal of truth in that image. Losing himself in thousands of friends, he found himself. Living completely in the present, he stumbled upon the long view. Surrendering and dispersing his identity, he yet made the world feel him at last as something tough, something singular, something leathery with life. But there was one virtue the meanest allotment holders have, which he conspicuously lacked. They weed their plots 
while he left to time and chance and the nearsighted pecking of critics, the necessary pairing and cutting. He loves people. His poetry is a poetry of love and faith. And he would not like this because these words are a bit marshmallow, Turkish delight, and of course he prefers rough oatmeal. But nevertheless, I think his poetry essentially is of that kind. And that is what the private man is, as opposed to the professional agitator, the compulsive joiner of splinter groups. He is a minority party of one, really. But what a one. Yet, he I silence left, the croon o' awe. Know her, wha on the hills lang syne I saw lifting a forehead of perpetual snow. Know her withouten shape, whose name is Death. Know him, unkennable abyss to faith. Oh, I hae silence 